everybody. Welcome to the second day of our meeting. And today we've got the, uh, a discussion. As you, as you know, uh, the plan is as follows after my short introduction. Each of the four panelists will give a short, very short lecture or rather statement, about 10 12 minutes, to give a general perspective on the three uh, topics. I will remind you in a moment. And then a discussion will follow with, the, uh, with your participation. If you, if you uh, uh, wish to ask questions or make comments, you're welcome. And well, then a short summary, each of you will also have uh, the possibility to, to give a brief summary of the, of the discussion. Now, uh, we've got three questions. Uh, the first of questions or sets of questions. <laughs> To be exact, the first one is uh, other mathematical results in the last 50 years, and I will comment on this uh, shortly, uh, which have philosophical influence, effects, implications. If so, what are the results? How do they influence philosophy? So this is the first uh, set of problems and a very short comments. It's obvious that there are lots of uh, important uh, mathematical and logical results in history of mathematics and logics. This is, this is obvious on my view. Oh. Historically, beginning in the 20th century. And just to mention a few, Hilbert's axiomatic method and the emergence of, of formal logic and the emergence of model theories, a branch of, of mathematics and logic and the point of view. Uh, Gödel's uh, results I mean, the incompleteness theorems, which are one set of results, and uh, uh, results concerning the continuing hypothesis, I mean, the first half of the results concerning the, uh, the consistency, uh, the method of the, the constructible universe uh, of Gödel, uh, Cohen's forcing, which has given rise to a picture of several results, and is a big business, so to say, uh, nowadays. But of course, all these uh, all these results have profound uh, implications on philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of logic, philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, philosophy in general. Uh, and uh, I think it's also interesting to have a look at uh, the last 50 years, so so that we try to 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 show some of the important developments in mathematics, in foundations of mathematics, which have philosophical importance. So that's the reason why we uh, have decided to set up courses in more or less arbitrary state, 50 years, but it's not worse than any other. So, so that's the reason. So this is the first set of topics. Well, the second uh, set of topics is do philosophical considerations have an influence on the development of mathematics? Are they limited only to inspirations and reflections on philosophy and the foundations of mathematics? And again, this is a big metaphilosophical topic or metamathematical topic, depending on the, on the perspective. And of course, we might just draw some two very extreme views. One extreme is, is that there is no genuine influence, so that of course philosophy provides some tools to reflect on mathematics, as it provides tools and methods to reflect on anything, in physics or culture in general. But what's uh, really important for the development of mathematics are well, other rules or mechanisms, maybe inner mechanisms, somehow internal to mathematics, or maybe somehow external to mathematics, but not necessarily philosophical. So this is one possible extreme view. That the other extreme is that, well, in principle, almost all, apart from measures zero set, so to say, almost all of mathematics is, in principle, just a kind of struggling with philosophical problems. For example, well, set theory is just an attempt to understand infinity, which is a philosophical notion per se. So in this sense, well, set theory is the formal expression of some 
philosophical uh, intuitions, considerations, etc., etc. Model theory is the semantics for formal languages, but semantics is not something which is per se mathematical. Calculus is the attempt to understand change, etc., etc. So in this, in this sense, the answer is obviously yes. I think that neither of the extreme views is, is true, and and uh, which is uh, what the genuine truth we will learn in, in a few minutes from the panelists. And the, sec and the, and, and the last set is a uh, set of problems is, is are there possible applications of mathematics in philosophy? In what direction should the relations between philosophy and mathematics develop? What areas of mathematics can be important for philosophy? And what awaits mathematical philosophy? So the, the last question is, is, uh, consists of four questions. And again, there are obvious applications of mathematics and formal methods to philosophy, or all possible branches of mathematics which are connected in this or that sense with logic, set theory, model theory, Cartesian theory, etc., etc. This is a, the first and obvious uh, example. Perhaps slightly different, or maybe even quite different examples. For example, it is the probability theory and uh, applying the methods for theory of rational choice or formal epistemology and things like that. So, this is a different kind of application. Uh, I also have to mention category theory, which is, of course, a very different uh, perspective on the foundations of mathematics. But these are just quite obvious examples, and, and there are, I think, also <coughs> other. Well, what direction? Uh, and, and there's the term should. Well, I, my hope is that the, the links will be becoming stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. But of course, philosophy has its own methods, its own uh, problems. So. Uh, it, it, it will not just become a part of, uh, of, of mathematics. And, well, the last question, what awaits mathematical philosophy? The answer is obvious, it will be flourished, and I think this discussion is, is an example. So now uh, let's turn to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the talks, and the order is, so to say, the natural geographic order. <laughs> Professor Leitke, Professor Wolenski, Professor Nevelski, and Professor Push each will give a, a short 10-12 uh, minutes. Thank you. I've prepared some slides. Good morning. You still came on a, on a, on a Saturday, which is very nice. Alright, so why mathematical philosophy? So I'm, I'm going to take up the third couple of questions and then thereby indirectly address the first two questions as well. Um, uh, so I think we all agreed on what we mean by mathematical philosophy here in the context of this uh, workshop. It's the application of logical and mathematical methods to philosophical questions and problems. Okay? Um, so when, when I created this label in my plan for this Munich Center for the Mathematical Philosophy in 2010, um, um, I, I wanted to have a catchy name, so I subsumed the logical methods under the Mathematical ones. Okay, so you know, if you're a logician, you shouldn't think you're excluded by that because think of the logical methods as being included in the mathematical ones. Um, this idea of applying mathematical methods in philosophy is not a new one. Uh, you, you could go back to Aristotle and syllogistic so logic or so, but it's maybe more appropriate to point to Leibniz. Um, the only way to rectify our reasonings is to make them as tangible as those of the mathematicians so that we can find our error at a glance, and when there are disputes among persons, including philosophers, of course, we can simply say, let us calculate, calculate us. And that's, that's the basic idea. It's just that, when Leibniz thought there might be a unique canonical way of doing so, um, there is not, okay, as, as, as we now think. And Patrick Suppis nicely uh, summarized that um, when he said there is no agreed upon formal methodology, um, in particular, it's not just the logical methods that a variety of methods are available and appropriate, and that's exactly what you find in, in recent mathematical philosophy. So let me give you uh, some um, examples of how mathematical methods can be applied um, in philosophy. 
One is, and we heard about that uh, already yesterday, um, to improve philosophical concepts. Okay. So, this improving philosophical concepts has a name, uh, namely, it's rational reconstruction by explication, that's the technical term for that. Um, that doesn't just happen in philosophy, it also happens in mathematics itself, it happens in the sciences, but it also happens in philosophy. And the idea is that, amongst others, what we strive for in philosophy is to make our philosophical concepts clearer and more exact. Okay? Um, so, that's the old idea of conceptual analysis, but when you find that there is something not quite right about that concept, maybe it's inconsistent in the application to a certain domain, then we should also repair it, and that goes beyond conceptual analysis. That's where we improve our mathematical concepts, uh, or philosophical concepts, and it's very natural that if you want to make a concept clearer and more exact, that mathematical concepts will help you to do so. And the paradigm case example we talked about already yesterday, that's Tarski on the concept of truth. Okay? So, as, as Jan said, I think we agree that Tarski is progress. Okay? Um, and he used formal methods. Uh, for that purpose. It's also open-ended and quite pluralistic what you find here. Okay? Because Tarski or truth, that's not the end of the story. Okay? So, feed forward 1975 Kripke on truth, I would see is an improvement over Tarski on truth. Okay? And it's very clear in what sense it's an improvement. There's a bigger domain, okay? because now you can apply the truth predicate to sentences that include that very truth predicate. And Kripke is not the end of the story either, and so on and so forth. And it's pluralistic because a rational reconstruction explication might not just point to one successor concept, but to several ones. Okay? And they compete with each other and are maybe useful for, for different purposes. A different kind of application of logical methods is to systematize and justify philosophical claims. Okay? So obviously, I should say that obviously, the idea of mathematical philosophy is not to reduce philosophy to mathematics in any sense. That would be just as absurd as thinking we use mathematics in physics, oh, thereby we reduce physics to mathematics. Of course, that's not the case, right? That would be silly, and it would be silly here as well. So what you do is rather you accumulate some philosophical axioms or postulates in some area, right? Epistemology, metaphysics, you, you name it. Um, maybe these axioms already include improved philosophical concepts where the improvement came about by using mathematical concepts. Okay? That makes mathematical theorems now applicable. And with the help of these mathematical theorems, we can now justify philosophical conclusions. Okay? So that's very much what the physicists would do when they derive a prediction from physical law hypothesis, boundary conditions, and mathematics. Okay? To give a philosophical example, so say the philosophical conclusion is a norm, actually. If you're rational, you ought to distribute your degrees of belief according to the axioms of probability. Okay? So that's a norm that you find in subjective probability theory. Okay? It's an epistemological norm. And there are justifications of that norm of different sort. Think of the Dutch book arguments, okay, so that's Definetti. Think of the decision theoretic representation theorems, okay, Savage. And there is a lot of recent work, okay. So, for example, Chin Choice's work on epistemic justifications of probabilism, okay. So, there, roughly, the idea is uh, uh, try to make your beliefs as accurate as possible, okay. And you can prove that if you distribute your degrees of belief in a way that doesn't conform to a probability measure, there is ways to be more accurate than that. Okay? And that's the justification. Another application would be, again, you accumulate some philosophical axioms which you think are more or less plausible. Okay? You have mathematics in the background, and then you derive a contradiction. Okay? Well, so what you thereby do is, you, you, you give an impossibility result. Okay? So, since we wouldn't question normally the mathematical theorems, which normally are quite mundane pieces of mathematics, okay? not the fancy ones. Okay? Um, so you would question thereby the conjunction of these philosophical axioms. Of course, then the question is who is the bad guy? Right? And then progress is being made. Okay? But in any case, the possibility theorem usually is a starting point for you know, an improved philosophical discussion. So a paradigm case example would be David Lewis on um, probability of conditionals versus conditional probability. Okay? So Ernest Adams, Stallmaker then, they suggested that we should measure the degree of acceptability by which a rational agent accepts indicative conditionals by means of the corresponding conditional probability of the consequent given the antecedent. Okay, very plausible assumption. <coughs> At the assumption that Stallmaker did, but not Adams, that indicative conditionals express propositions, they have truth conditions. Okay? Add some pretty 
modest side assumption that you get a contradiction. That's what, what, what they do is show. Again, it was the beginning of sort of a new era of work on the semantics and pragmatics of integrated condition. Okay, and that use of course probability theory. Crucial. You can also prove the consistency of philosophical claims by building a model in the model theoretic sense. Okay? Now, of course, this is, you could say, the mere consistency, but you know, that's the starting point. If you fail to build a model, that would be bad. So let's build a model, let's learn from it. Okay? So for example, I said, um, Tarski and Kripke are true, was not the end of the story. How do we feel proved upon Kripke? Okay? He gave a theory um, of type 3 truth, right, for the liar paradox and the like, where you can express the truth scheme, not as Kripke had it in the meta language, but in the object language, by a new kind of biconditional okay, that behaves non-classically, Okay, so it's a non-classical system, and what he does is he builds a model for it. Okay, so that's exactly the methodology. And finally, um, you can study some philosophical problems by building a model, but now not in the logicians, in the model theoretic sense, but in the sense of the physicist. Okay, where a model is something like a set of highly idealized assumptions about some system. Okay, and you're aware that it's idealized. Okay, but you still want to learn from it because you know you want to study a problem first in a simple and controlled environment. Okay, and that's what people do. So, for example, there are papers on, on social norms, okay? sometimes called descript descriptive norms, okay? like conventions in society. Okay? How do they come about? Okay? Well, how much assumptions do you uh, have to make in order to derive the likely emergence of a social norm? Okay? And people do that by building models in that sense, and then these models you can actually study by computer simulations. Okay? So, in our master program in Munich, for example, our master students they learn. To, to, to use computer simulations in the applications, say in social philosophy or in epistemology and the like. Okay? And this is not unusual anymore at all. So let me finish by a couple of examples. Okay? Now, there are lots of examples in the philosophy of mathematics. Okay? We have talked about some of them yesterday already. Okay? Fair enough. The philosophy of physics, same thing, philosophy of statistics, but that's sort of cheating in a sense. Because the subject areas already use formal methods, right? And now we do philosophy of that subject areas. So you might say, no wonder that the mathematical methods play a role in philosophy, okay? That's not a big surprise, okay? But it's still, it should be obvious, right, that in these areas, mathematical methods play a crucial role, okay? So the incompleteness theorems and, you know, Gödel himself argued that from a mechanistic thesis and by incompleteness theorems, you can argue that the knowable arithmetical theorems the set of knowable arithmetic theorems couldn't co coincide with the set of true arithmetic statements. Okay? Um, that's clearly of interest for philosophy of mathematics. Uh, if you want to analyze potential infinity, right, like we had it back from Aristotle, okay, the best way of doing it, introduce a modal operator. Okay? Otherwise, this difference between actual and potential infinity you wouldn't be able to capture. And there's recent work by Oyster Dinamo and others on that topic. Okay. Probability logic and probability, structuralism and second order logic, we talked about the categoricity results already yesterday. Abstraction principles that already was Frege was interested in, and, and neologicism, okay, and so on and so forth. But let me give you a list of other examples in many other areas. Okay? Um, so I, I, I'll just read them to you. And the point is just you shouldn't be impressed afterwards. Okay? So keep that in mind. Okay? Don't, don't, don't forget. Okay? So think of similarity and resemblance nominalism. Okay, somehow similarity is more basic than properties. That's the idea. Okay, so people are working on that and they use graph theoretic methods. And it's natural because the similarity relation naturally is regarded as you know, the edges in the graph. Okay? All, everything in logic, obviously, right? But don't forget, logic is an area, a proper area of philosophy itself. Okay? Um, take the ontological argument for the existence of God. We, I, I assume, we agree that there's a problem with all these arguments, but if you want to put your finger on where the problem is, you need to use logical methods. Okay? Um, uh, the modern theoretic arguments concerning realism and anti realism, right? Putnam, right? Clearly, that's starting from modern theory and then philosophically interpreting it. There is a forthcoming book on philosophy and modern theory uh, by Tim Putnam and Joe Walsh. Okay? Have, a, have a look at it. Okay? That summarizes all the implications of modern theory. Then everything to do with semantics, okay, including intentional semantics, uh, uh, the semantics of modalities, possible world semantics. Okay? That's not just logic, it's also graph theory, right? because our modal axioms now characterize graph theoretic properties of an accessibility relation. Postulates for rational belief, so that's epistemology. Okay? So, you know, in a sense, you can measure rational belief on different kinds of scales of measurement. There's categorical or nothing belief, 
right? There is belief on an ordinal scale, on a comparative scale. There is belief on a numerical scale, think of probabilities. Okay? Uh, and there is also the form of theories about, about that. Okay? Um, how to aggregate beliefs between different persons. Okay? The form of theories uh, have been developed up there. Uh, how to define properly, in probabilistic terms, what the coherence of a set of propositions is like. So that's the coherence theory of justification made precise by probabilistic means. Okay? Um, Quite similarly for knowledge, okay? So obviously you would use epistemic logic. And this is not just a little gadget, okay? If you open Jim Williamson's knowledge and its limits, which, you know, I, I think we can agree is the leading monograph in, in epistemology in the last, you know, what, 20 years or so, okay? You will see it's, it's epistemic logic everywhere and probability theory, okay? Um, philosophy of time, you can't do that these days anymore without temporal logic in the background. Okay, similar metaphysics, metaphysical necessity, counterfactuals. Of course, you will use what you have, the critical semantics. David Lewis's semantics for conditionals, right? That's total pre-orders, okay, the logic that comes out of it. If you want to study objective chance in metaphysics or in philosophy of science, you use probability theory. You use reflection principles to describe bridges between objective chance and subjective probability, okay? Um, if it's about the acceptability of conditionals, I already mentioned that, uh, that, that you normally do in probabilistic terms. Abstraction, but now not in mathematics. All kinds of abstractions of point-like entities from extended entities. Okay? So this is Russell on points of time. Okay? Current up on qualities in the alpha. Um, um, Whitehead on extended abstraction. Okay? And I mentioned Mary topology here in, in honor of, of, of Ian. So you, 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 you're, you're smiling, but it's fair, right? The idea is you start from something extended, right? Rather than something point-like. Um, inductive, abductive reasoning, no topic, right, since Aristotle. Um, confirmation of a scientific hypothesis by data, right, you want to explicate that. You want to explicate explanatory power or how to learn rationally, okay, where the difference might be between learning a proposition and learning a conditional, this might not be the same thing, okay. Um, so how do you do that? Well, by means of subjective probability theory, belief revision theory is another method, okay, and you can import methods from computer science, right, statistical learning theory would be a, would be a typical case. Okay. Infinity, just look, already uh, mentioned that. I, I don't claim that you know, the calculus and set theory addresses all the problems to do with infinity that philosophers have accumulated in the history of philosophy. No. But if you, if you look at these problems and you don't have a clue about the calculus, limits, and set theory, there's something crucially that, that you're missing. I think you can agree on that. Okay. Um, the theory of definitions, what's the scientific theory, What's the scale of measurement? All of that has been explicated in the philosophy of science by modern theoretic means, by proof theoretic means. Meta ethics, okay, have a look at Gerhard okay, Schultz's uh, monograph on the Isor problem, okay, old Hume thesis. It's very clear that without the optic logic, you know, uh, you, you can't make the progress that Gerhard Schultz uh, has done. In, in the area of decision theory, right, consequentialism in ethics, pragmatics, uh, think of David Lewis on conventions, okay? Social philosophy, have a look at Brian Skirks on the evolution of the social contract. That's about evolutionary game theory, an application to social philosophy, okay? And no, don't, don't say, well, I'm not, I'm not sure this is a good thing. It's Brian Skirks, okay? So yes, it's a good thing. It is a good thing, okay? Uh, Mariology, okay? Mariology on the former side is something like a theory of Boolean algebras, okay? And again, there's a Polish background, so that, that would be Tarski again, okay? Uh, causality. So these days, you can't work on causality and causal explanation without your causal models, right? Structural equations, Bayesian networks, okay? That's the state-of-the-art method that people use to, to define causal expl uh, explanation, okay? Um, I would also say the nature of mental states, okay? So that's where computability theory played a role, okay? Understanding mental states as computational states. You might say that that was a mistake, okay? But I think it was progress, finding out what the mistake was where mental states might go beyond computational or functional states, right? In order to even address the question, you need to have computability theory in the background, okay? Well, for functionism, think of ramification, right? That's a logical method, that's high order logic applied, okay? Theories of properties, natural properties, dispositions, okay? So these days, it's high order logic. Um, natural properties, you can maybe reconstruct, Peter Gantel suggested that, in conceptual spaces as convex regions, okay? There's a geometry, maybe, to naturalness, and, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's why I would say even in philosophy, can't do this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our second speaker is Rosalyan Polanski. So I will address to uh, this 
three questions, briefly, and I'm not a mathematician, so I cannot say what you can expect in the development of mathematics, and it's relevant for philosophy. So I read several companions, surveys, and so on, uh, published in the last 60 years, and some. Uh, I think that you can derive some conclusions from it is my uh, uh, sort of name uh, evaluation or, or picture. So first that mathematics becomes more and more specialized. I mean pure mathematics. Uh, now, Fifty years ago we had entries about topology and now is about several algebraic topology, same geometry and so on. Algebra is analytic number theory, algebraic number theory. And I think that this development maybe will be important for philosophy of mathematics and foundations, I don't know. However, I am skeptical. It is not bad, of course, we, we, we shouldn't evaluate the order of mathematics from the point of view of philosophy, of course. Uh, other tendency, which is rather clear, that uh, uh, maybe not yet dominant, but anyway, uh, more and more um, relevancy or, or, or development of applied from computation and, and so there are, as I was companion, Princeton companion to mathematics, and Princeton companion to applied mathematics, the second is about one third larger than the first. Is, is it relevant for philosophy or, or not? We will see. Uh, New, uh, this book, Philosophy and Modern Theory, was mentioned by the second book published in this year, Category of Theory for Working Philosophers, which is, of course, a replica of the title famous book by McLean, um, Category of Theory for Working Mathematicians, Category of Working Mathematicians. Some people expect that category theory will be uh, uh, very important for philosophy. I am modestly skeptical. And at this case, I would, I would like to distinguish two important things in the application of mathematics in philosophy, to philosophy of mathematics, and to general philosophy. There are two different things. My quite surprising prediction is that mathematics will become more relevant than physics, perhaps except cosmology. Because theoretical physics becomes a, a mathematics, in fact, and is not transparent from even from physics, it's elementary practice and so on. So, uh, Maybe that uh, mathematics of so stochastic phenomena as the right of understanding of our world is something which we should expect for the future. I mean, chaotic phenomena, chaotic phenomena, and so on, so on. So, it is a new picture of uh, universal ontology, but it's important for very deep questions. For example, creationism in religious sense or not. So um, I think that there is no other way to understand at the moment than by probabilistic picture. So this is what I can say in this short time. Second, uh, philosophy and, uh, and mathematics. So, this is an example of Poland and Polish mathematical school. Yes, that 
The utopia culture of this group was very high. Heibel was a very peculiar attitude to philosophy, maybe expressed in the best way by Chopin's in his writings about the action of Charles. He says in, uh, it was repeated since early 20s until his last monograph, Cardinal Leonardo. Okay, there are several philosophical controversies around the axiom of choice. However, it is a mathematical theorem, axiom, and we should know what we can do with this axiom and what we are it. And for this school of mathematics, okay, we must know what we can prove without, for example, the axiom of choice, independently of our, of our, of, uh, our uh, philosophical standpoints in the foundation of the standpoint. And thus he was uh, repeated this, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this position, not strange because it was his letter. Sierpinski, he was asked to announce, is a I repeat by my words, it is a, a, a kind of incoherence in your practice. You are a nominalist and you are working on very high subtle. How you can combine this? So this, this, there are two different problems. It's my philosophical views and practice of mathematics. Yes. He's, he, he, he said even Set theory is a heavy story, but quite good. So, uh, the problem of art, you have another attitude, for my set theoretical patterns, for example, uh, or intuition, flowers of these are examples that mathematics is strongly dependent on uh, philosophical views. So what is uh, important was again that philosophy is a part of intellectual culture, the mathematics is done in this uh, intellectual culture, which includes philosophy, and in this sense philosophy is relevant. You can easily show that uh, uh, mathematics in countries which had a high philosophical culture or communities were done more successfully than in other countries. For example, Soviet mathematics was very high but was strict. So they, they did some artificial philosophical work not authentic scientific culture, of course, is a very gifted nation, so they produce great mathematicians, but in general, the level was perhaps not so like in the United States, for example. Or, 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 uh, the same was in Germany, you know. German mathematics after the Nazi time declined, really. So philosophy plays a part. And of course, uh, the third question, mm, which is for me uh, the most interesting, so I would say in this way, that we should distinguish two kinds of philosophizing. One philosophers intend to produce philosophical theories, great philosophical theories which are usually identified with philosophical <coughs> direction currents and so on. Phenomenology, existentialism, postmodernism, and so on. I don't evaluate. And I think that mathematics has no particular importance for such philosophizing. I remember from my student time, Roman in Garden, who was even partially uh, educated as a mathematician. He was a teacher of mathematics uh, just after returning from, from Germany. Husserl was a good mathematician. He was an 
nesu sveiki. Baiži tās pats, ir Filirīt, buks, or writings of this great philosophers. You cannot find very, very much, not even mathematical thing. So, in such case, and I think in the past was the same. You say that Plato was, for example, influenced by mathematics. Uh, I am not sure about this. So, he knew mathematics, of course, he was just propaganda that, and, that don't enter this place with her knowing geometry, but, but his mathematical achievements was almost no. So, and, and other great philosophers, except for exception, Leibniz, for example, but it is also unknown how this monadology was really actually influenced by Second type is to uh, do philosophy by solving or analyzing, I would say, problems. And this was given by Hannes, so I will not repeat. Uh, 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 there are, of course, some discussions about all philosophical problems listed by you are generally genuine philosophical problems, for example, is in the analysis of emergence of social norms. It doesn't deal with philosophy, but it's a... So, another, but, but there's an important question. How conclusive are uh, solutions by using mathematical concepts or mathematical method, methods? So I think that con conclusiveness is very limited to some community. For example, some people agree that <coughs> getting spiritual intelligence of God is okay, other not. It's the same with modern formalizations of uh, communistic arguments. But I think that it's a progress because why, uh, uh, why I I like or some, or, or I, I, I do uh, such a philosophy. Because I, I, I know what is going on. I can, for example, quarrel with others or anybody who shares uh, the, this methodology. Of course, I understand Hegel, or can understand partially, the same as with this Hegel. I I partially. The advantage is that I am sure that Heidegger never understood analytic philosophy. His discussion with Karnap showed. However, it is difficult to convince Heideggerians that he usually was speaking nonsense or from our point of view. However, this is a good job in philosophy. According to metaphoric philosophical point of view, which I openly express our voice, that we can communicate. And once again, the advantage is that for people who prefer mathematical methods, it is much easier to, if they want, of course, to read uh, Heidegger try to understand and the story of the end. Of this story, I remember that was a, 54 years ago, I guess, was a meeting of Polish Philosophical Society in Warsaw, and Janina Kotelinska delivered the talk on the limit of applications of logical methods. It was published in a very, very good paper, and then Leszek Kolakowski, Objected that you, that you, you use Heidegger's, uh, that's neat, it's neat that uh, famous statements as an example of something which is silly and so on, but it is, it functions in an entire context and so on, so it is a result of uh, uh, contextually less. Uh, and he says, well, I know this 
fragment only from second hand. I never read uh, read Heidegger. Uh, uh, now, what was the mystery of this discussion? Rudolf Karna delivered a talk in Warsaw in 1931. It was his first visit about the window that the physics the revolutionized the Sprach, Spanish paper, the paper, and Deutsch Abstract quoted this German sentence. Probably the translator never uh, didn't know how to translate it to Polish. And Kotarbinska was an audience of this, so probably she remembered after 60, 70, more than 70 years that she had some strange, a strange uh, uh, sentence. By the way, Kahneman, when he discussed the sentence, he discussed the entire context, not one uh, sentence. So we should be very careful in evaluation of such situation. Thank you very much. And the third <coughs> part, the third talk will be a good by Professor Neves. So I will refer to the questions posed for our discussion as a mathematician and logician, mathematical logician. The first question are the mathematical results in the last 50 years of the development of mathematics, which have philosophical significance. Well, uh, Professor Wojtowicz already mentioned several of these results, and, uh, well, let me just focus on some of them that I consider, I personally consider important and interesting. I already mentioned yesterday mm, the results of model theory mm. and the insight of uh, Zilber, Boris Zilber, and his uh, general program of understanding uh, mathematical reality and its deep roots in logic. So I will not repeat this. And second thing, uh, well, I think that uh, in set theory, the development that was already mentioned by Krzysztof Wojtowicz, uh, this form, the, the, the method of forcing, when we, original, okay, original this was just made by, uh, <coughs> as a method, by Paul Cohen as a method to show that uh, the continuum hypothesis is uh, relatively independent from set theory. But uh, so it was syntactic, very syntactic originally. But later, and it already passes the 50 years uh, 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 deadline. Later, Soloway, in early 70s, he changed the outlook on the forcing method to make it more semantic. I mean, the way that uh, set theorists look at it now, for many years already, they look at uh, forcing method as a way of producing alternative uh, set theoretical universes. And uh, by doing so, uh, there, well, the question originates on the, like, uh, when, when we look at set theory as a meta theory for mathematics, in which we can formalize all of mathematics, then there is a question on the set theoretical universe as a possible. Uh, formalization of the work of mathematical objects. But now, if we give up with a single set theory as a 
foundation <coughs> of this view, if we allow variants with various axioms that can be either accepted or rejected, then what kind of uh, mathematical reality is provided by this approach? These are like alternative realities. And so I think that uh, this, uh, <coughs> this should provide for philosophers some food for thought. Second question. Do philosophical considerations have an influence on the development of mathematics? Just like Professor Wolensky mentioned already, I am a bit skeptical about it. I mean, there were times, like particularly in development of mathematical logic and in particular the modern theory, where philosophical considerations were really the starting point. But, you know, mathematicians are not philosophers. They do not pursue philosophy. They pursue specific mathematical research. And so, um, this <coughs> they do not really uh, look for the inspiration, deep inspiration in philosophy. Some of them do, but most, most of them not. On the other hand, are, they, are these philosophical considerations limited only to inspirations and reflections on philosophy and foundations of mathematics? Well, I think there is one very serious issue in the relationship between mathematics and philosophy. Namely, and I, I, had, I had a personal experience of it coming from, from my personal development in mathematics and my experience with students, namely, and young mathematicians. Not only young. Uh, I mean, there is a basic issue now in mathematics. Mathematics becomes, just like Professor Wolensky mentioned, more and more specialized. So people pursue this specific calcul, calcula, like Professor God Leitke mentions here, and often they may lose sight of the reason in it. Why to do it? And so then philosophy may come to the rescue. I mean, there, there are basic questions on truth in mathematics on the nature of mathematical reality. And I noticed that students, for instance, are very much interested in learning mathematics, not just, not only by, by just learning the next set of axioms and the next set of uh, technical tricks to manipulate yourself, but are willing really, really to understand what it is made for, what are the justifications? And here, uh, philosophical outlook is indispensable. So the only problem is that uh, it is hard to speak about philosophy. I believe, I, I suspect that for philosophers, it is hard to speak to mathematicians, common mathematicians, so that they understand to avoid to avoid the hermetic language and to refer to the more current issues that arise in mathematics. And then mathematicians, I believe that they are really, they will be really interested in discussions like this. And the third item, are the possible applications of mathematics in philosophy? I am also skeptical about it. When I, when I think of real applications of mathematics, and not just, just as Professor Leitke mentioned in his long list, not just as applications of uh, some mathematical formalism. Because we have to, in mathematics, we have to discern between uh, mathematics as a set of theorems, results of which mathematicians are proud, results that mathematicians try to question, that mathematicians try to solve, 
and the setup of basic uh, notions. I know that this distinction is a bit vague. The setup of basic notions that is uh, well used to do mathematics, and this setup, when we look at the history of development of mathematics, it has changed in time. Like in the old, long, long ago, mathematics was just calculus with numbers. Then functions came to the picture, like with mathematical analysis. And in the 20th century, the outlook on mathematics broadened tremendously, but still there is a focus in it on, on some well, historically determined content and we should remember it. So, okay, like modern theory and mathematical logic it provides a framework to speak about any objects, any theory. But not every theory is mathematical. It is historically determined entity. Mathematics is historically determined entity. And now, uh, of course, of course, outside of mathematics, in philosophy, in sociology, in biology, in, the, in music. There may be mathematical language used. We may use mathematical language to speak more precisely about several issues. And this is very commendable. But I would be cautious, particularly with philosophy, I would be cautious with it. When you look at philosophy, well, coming back to the Greece, Greek ancient times, the Love of wisdom. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. But when you remember the general scheme of development, so the, 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 the science started with philosophy, and then particular sciences split from it. When a particular science, when, when a part of philosophy, as understood by ancient Greeks, has uh, invented some specific methods, then it was split from philosophy and then it lived as a separate uh, branch of science. Uh, so I think that it's important, the vagueness in philosophy, the vagueness in philosophy paradoxically is important. Because philosophy, philosophy refers to the part of reflection of the reality that is not determined yet, that is somehow uh, beyond the grasp of uh, special sciences. And uh, because of this, uh, this is my personal outlook on the I and people may disagree, of course, but because of this, uh, well, uh, it is natural that it is, uh, <coughs> that it must operate with vague notions and try somehow to organize them. But there is a there is an maybe a problem with it because it becomes a too, too too well if philosophy manages to explain things too well then economy and other things, then this part of our knowledge about reality becomes specialized and splits from philosophy. It's no longer philosophy. Okay, so mm. and another thing is don't think, like many people who, who become familiar with mathematics which is maybe the greatest achievement of mankind, intellectual achievement, so they see how powerful tool it is. However, it is not a magic stick. I mean, by applying, by Try to apply mathematical language, we do not gain uh, really uh, much more knowledge about the subject. It's just, I think that mathematics, when used as a tool to develop, uh, to develop philosophy, for example, well, it should be remembered that it's just a tool. That, uh, and that as a tool itself, it is not by a magic way. It will not produce some great truths. That is, one should remember that uh, uh, specific philosophical insight into the problems is also very, very important. Maybe that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, and the last part, the last talk.
still in my focus zone. But you will be very concise because I understand that you want to leave some time for the discussion. So, and that this is the first, uh, first reason why I want to be short. The second is that obviously I am not a specialist like my, my uh, previous speakers who are philosophers and mathematicians. So, uh, I can only say that, uh, that, for example, for me it's very hard to, 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 to say something about the first point, so what are the mathematical results in 50 years, because I do not follow actually the, 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 the development of mathematics so closely that I can say it. I, would, I want only to, to, to say first that I concur with, with many of the statements which are already uh, uh, presented here. So, for example, it is clear for me that, that uh, uh, application of mathematics to philosophy has nothing to do with formalization of the, so, so simply rewriting uh, philosophical statements or postulates in, in formal language is uh, only then interesting if it can, as in physics, when, can I, when, when I can at the very end obtain something new as a result of this, okay? of this uh, application. And this, I think, is very rare. Although I have, although I have some experience uh, from my youth, when I was inspired by my philosophy teacher to rewrite, to, to formulate uh, Aristotelian physics as a canonical theory, like we do in mathematics, in physics, uh, for with, with Newtonian theory. Okay, so this was possible. And what is interesting that they, they, they could draw some 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 uh, consequences out of that. For example, there is a distinguished point in the universe. Okay, so which probably philosophers knew. Okay, so for Aristotle's for Aristotle it was clear. But okay, so this is this is this is the way of I would say application. I would like to see uh, also from this application of mathematics. In, in philosophy, so this I want to 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 to, to connect this uh, first question with the third question, uh, abstracting on, on particular results of mathematics, which I don't don't know about too much. So there are possible applications, provided that you can do something like that. Okay, so this is for me I think, the crucial point that you can obtain something new to you. You can really answer some question that just by application. Otherwise, it is nice, okay, to have it more small, more strict, and so on, so on. But the problem is whether you obtain something new from that. It's nice to hear from you that there are not so rare situations when something like this happens. But uh, this, is the, the, this is the first Best condition, I think, uh, if 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 applications of mathematics and philosophy are, are uh, something which we, we should we should uh, consider very serious. Uh, what concerns uh, and the, okay, so what are the what are the the, the, the parts of mathematics which I which I, I see uh, as potentially uh, important, and this is definitely uh, connected with my, my own uh, activity in, in, in physics, and here I would concur with Professor Molenski about all these uh, problems connected with uh, uh, probability, chaotic motion, and so on, something like that. This I will, this I think, I hope, that it will bring something to, to understanding these issues because uh, I think that with understanding probability it is still a problem even among physicists. Okay? So physicists also have some problems with understanding that. So, uh, this, the third thing which is on the fringe of, all of this discussion is that uh, whether there are mathematical results which are of importance for philosophy. I think that 
that not so much are per se interesting from the philosophical point of view. There is a hard work of philosophers to make something interesting, philosophically interesting, out of, out of uh, mathematical results. As far as I understand, Gödel's result was immediately somehow uh, <coughs> perceived by philosophers by something interesting. But I could imagine the following attitude to the Gödel's, uh, to the Gödel's results. Let's say that I say to some layman, but well educated in mathematics, understanding what is axiomatic method and so on, I say, look, you have these ax uh, axioms here, and then you can derive, you know how to derive theorems from these axioms, and then you obtain theorems, and to look, there are some theorems which I know they are true, but cannot be proved. This is axiom. What is this first reaction? Your axioms are wrong. Okay, so, uh, the situation is then much more complicated because even I, if I add this, what I can, I know it is true, it is still not enough and still enough. So what is the, the obvious reaction? So maybe it is axiomatic uh, method you are accustomed to. It's not a proper way of, of, of doing mathematics. But this is not a philosophical answer, this is a methodological answer. Okay? So maybe you should do a little bit differently in mathematics. You are accustomed to the fact that you can put a finite number of axioms or schemes or something like that. And this is, this is what you produce as mathematics. Why? Okay, so, so my point is that philosopher has to put a lot of effort to make something interesting philosophically, philosophically out of, out of, uh, out of uh, mathematic, purely mathematical result. Okay, so, so let me finish at this, at this point. Okay, so these are my remarks about this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all the, the, the speakers for, for the talks uh, and uh, now I open the discussion. Are there any questions? Yes, there are. Okay. But the questions I had to refer to the problems you, you have been uh, talking. Uh, first of all, uh, before I pass to philosophy, I'd like to uh, tell you a story about my disappointment with mathematics. Well, my first education was an engineer something between computer science and telecommunications. But then I, I studied mathematics, more or less pure mathematics, mostly stochastic processes, things like that. So when, when I had this mathematical education, I was sure that now I'm so wise that I will solve any problems that engineers may have. And it soon occurred absolutely not true. I was given a big problem to design, say, a network. Where design, it's a very complex thing that has very many aspects that cannot be expressed with the same language. So what can an engineer do? Decompose the problem into many aspects and decompose it in many, well, in many aspects, let's, let's stick to that. And it occurred that mathematics helps only in solving very special things. But the big problem is absolutely not mathematics. So it occurred that all my fancy education in mathematics didn't help very much. That was, this was very disappointing for me, really. Because I really like mathematics, but maybe from the point of view of the, construct, the conceptual structure of the thing, which is beautiful something. But now I come to uh, philosophy. But I think that but I'm also quite scared <laughs> because of my experience. Maybe it's not right to transpose this experience directly to, 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 uh, to philosophy, but I have the impression that, uh, well, surely mathematics penetrates philosophy, as <laughs> you have all described. But the problem is, can you really say what kind of aspects the math mathematics can answer? And how and what are the, 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 the solutions uh, given by mathematics conclusive, as you have mentioned? So, for me, uh, the link between math, uh, mathematics and philosophy is such that philosophy states the problems and shows the right way of decomposing the problems into many aspects, and then just showing where mathematics can enter very specific aspects. This is my uh, 
I'm very much influenced by my experience in doing engineering, actually, <laughs> big problems. Maybe my conclusions or skepticism concerning the applicability of mathematics to philosophy or uh, what kind of problems really can be solved, philosophical problems can be solved with mathematics are, well, maybe I said too much. I mean, the conclusion, maybe I jumped into conclusions because of my background, but, but still I'm quite skeptical. <laughs> Okay, so I give you two examples. They are personal examples. You have typical philosophical problems which can be illuminated by one logic, second by mathematics. This is from borderline of theology and, and, and philosophy. This is a sad way of Thomas Aquinas that if <coughs> there are contingent beings, it must be a necessary. No. Now, if you use modal logic, standard modal logic, you can show that there is no derivation of conclusion from premises. But this is not the end of discussion, because our friend from Berlin, for example, from University of can say, is not logical necessity but metaphysical necessity. And the discussion for me ends. However, what is a profit? That we know exactly what is the difference. He uses some philosophical idea, I think, okay, peace formalized. If you show a logical system in which your derivation is correct, I will agree. But if not, this is, no, we, we must, uh, you know, leave the uh, issue uns, uh, not conclusively solved. And this is a typical situation in philosophy because, you know, if non-philosophers expect that philosophers will give conclusive arguments, it is a historical mistake. This is one example. But can I just comment on that? No, no, no. <laughs> second. So, so second example is even more. What is being? Well, a classical problem. The con medieval con idea of transcendentalism. This is a transcendental co concept other than a kind concept. So we have a hierarchy, an Aristotelian hierarchy, and the top is being. And they say it is a very special concept. You cannot perform a typical um, operation which consists in negation of a general term. So, human, <coughs> non human. You cannot say being, non being. It is a very peculiar item, ontological item. You can try to analyze it. It is a class in the sense of set theory because to some extent <coughs> some operations on classes are restricted. This is an attempt to show that there is a good mathematical idea behind ontology. But of course a philosopher like Heidegger so, no, 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 because we must have an uh, insight into and so on. But it's another way. Apply knowledge. So, being is everything is collection of what exists in the logical sense. This is being, um, okay, two beings now, two parts, and so on. It's water. So the relation of being a part is not self-theoretical but neurological. And the situation changes because this transcendentality of being is not exp expressed even in this language, which, is a, which have a good you know, the, uh, log logical and mathematical background. But once again, philosophers not necessarily must agree at least some philosophy. This is a drama of philosophy, like uh, 
the W set, then we have this, this problem of, of, of seeing more in philosophy, but nothing is uh, priceless. Like in ordinary life, if we are so deep, we must resign from conclusiveness. This is a way of existence of philosophy and philosophers. It's a very nice situation. Maybe not tolerate for a scientist, but for me it's okay. I am very happy with, with this existential situation. Maybe. Yeah, just, okay, so okay. Let's give your example. Just because I have okay. I'm just forgetting what I wanted to say. The examples you have given, if I understand well, I, this, the, the problems, whether it's logic or metaphysics, for example. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, this is, in my wording, this was the, comp the composition into aspects. That's what I meant. And you give wonderful examples <laughs> to this the composition problem that we have to do to, in order to know what, we, what aspect we are speaking about. Okay, yeah. so, okay so two, two, two comments. So, uh, just, just a brief reply to, to some of the points, if I may. Okay. Um, uh, so, yeah, what you said, um, there is this distinction between analytic, maybe scientific philosophy and the other side, sort of continental. Okay. So, let me just say, I'm, it's not the idea of mathematical philosophy is not to throw the second part away. I can't speak for all mathematical philosophers, but to be honest, you know, I, I've read lots of these people. I've read my Hegel, not always with pleasure, but I've read it. Okay? Yeah. I, in the MCMP, I've organized two workshops with the Hegel chair. So at MCMP, German idealism workshop, okay? Of course, so the, the rules of the game were, okay, we want to make clear what you're saying, and they were in favor of that. We want to be mutually understood, okay? We try our best to do that, and it's possible, it's possible, okay? Um, it's allowed to say things like, I think that is false, and here's the argument, okay? And afterwards, let's go for a beer, okay? So these were the rules of the game, and they were obeyed, and it wasn't a problem, it was a tough discussion. And there are, um, applications even of formal methods that the Hegelians at this point in the history of philosophy would um, embrace. So think of Brandon, think of Robert, Robert Brandon, okay? that's an inferentialist slash proof theorist, proof theoretical account of um, Hegelianism. Okay? And it's not like you know, some strange decision comes around. So it's taken very seriously by, by the, by the uh, Hegelians that are still around. Um, in other branches of that side of philosophy, I would also allow myself to say there might be also something like degenerative research programs. And even they might accept that this can you know, tell us something negative about that. So that's, to be honest, my view, a bit of phenomenology. Um, okay, but anyway, it's not, not that you know, we, we, throw, we throw everything out. That's not a philosophy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, just, I just wanted to make that clear. To, just what we're doing here. Um, about this paper on social norms, it might sound like social, uh, like sociology, but read the paper. It's it's about social philosophy. It's about the conceptual and the possible. The, in this paper, they don't describe how uh, social norms actually emerge in society. So it's not a descriptive or explanatory paper about the social reality. It's something. Is it is it necessary to presuppose that in order for social norms norms to arise? So it's a, it's a philosophy of science question in the philosophy of the social sciences. Have a look at it. Um, about uh, uh, Professor Nivelsky. Um, so I, I think it's very important for philosophers to be modest about uh, sort of any ambitions to do with mathematics. Okay, so I, I, I embrace that completely. So for example, I would say for 99.9% .9 or whatever the number is of mathematics, philosophy is just you know, irrelevant. That is for the practicing mathematician, philosophy is just irrelevant. Okay? Where philosophy has been relevant and I think will be relevant is um, at the inception and the foundations of new mathematical um, frameworks, let me put it like this. Okay? And there are clear, clear examples like proof theory, like model theory, uh, set theory. These days, so this is not just talk about the past, uh, I already mentioned the homotopy type theory. This is not, you know, this is not weird 
logicians. I mean, you know, he, he passed away, but it's Wolodzki, so that, you know, it's a field medalist who was involved in that. Okay? And at this point, where, where the foundations are laid for homotopy theory, uh, philosophy has an input, and not just uh, you know, a slight one. So have a look at Steve Audi's work. He's a mathematician, also a philosopher. He's instrumental in bringing about homotopy type theory as a new framework for mathematics. And have a look at their book, they are very explicit about that. Um, but, you know, very soon this will be gone, and then it will be just ordinary mathematics and philosophy people have lost its role. And, you know, it's very important for philosophers to be modest about that. I'm totally with you on that. In, in maths education, I think people, sh the mathematicians, the young mathematicians should still learn about, for example, new computer theories, because they are just important mathematical theorems. That's nothing to do with philosophy. And secondly, at least once in their studies, they should, should hear about foundations of mathematics and philosophy of mathematics. Because I think it's part of what we should be trained at the university in the academic world to self-reflect. So at least once in their education, they should do that. And then they can forget about it and you know, do whatever they want to do in mathematics. Okay? But at least once, so there should be seminars like that. Okay? I think that's important for the mathematics education. But it's not to do so much with mathematics practice. Final point. On the other hand, I also think there should be modesty on the side of practicing mathematicians and physicists and computer scientists. Okay, so let me, let me be very blunt here. Okay, so I've given you a list of you know two slides of successful applications of mathematical methods in philosophy. So it's a bit sorry, strange to hear. That, yeah, I'm skeptical about this will work. You know, you're talking from. Can I be very blunt? And I like you all, but. You're talking from the prejudice of what you've grown up with. Okay? Put it bluntly, you don't have a clue about any of these applications. Have a look okay, at the MCMP from 2011 to 2016. We have collected 500 lectures by people on applications of mathematics and <laughs> philosophy. If you look at the leading journals in philosophy, and I mean the, you know, the standard journals, those that would give you tenure, okay? there's hardly an issue where you that you would find where not one, you know, where no article in that issue wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any application of form method. It has already happened. It's not, you know, it, it, there's no point anymore. You say, I'm not so sure. It, it's there. Nobody's claiming this is sort of, you know, filling up all of philosophy, as I said. Okay? But then it's important and then it's useful. I mean, just have a look at the examples. Okay? And there is one, one point that I would like to stress. So there's one thing that is wrong, I think, about what you said. Uh, but I like that they put it like that. Okay? So you make it sound the following way. So as you said, that's absolutely correct. Because science and philosophy they were the same for a long time. There was no division. There wasn't even the term science. There was just the term philosophy. Right? And physics would be natural philosophy and so on. Okay? That's a reason. It's, it's 19th century creation to distinguish conceptually between science and philosophy. Okay? But I would claim okay, there was always these two streams that ran in this agglomerate of science and philosophy. One was describing, explaining, and predicting natural phenomena in the empirical world. Okay? Another stream was mathematics. I would, I would say pure mathematics. Okay? And another was um, studying and improving human reason independently of what the world is like. They were mixed up, and it was unclear what was what. Okay? But with the emergence of science as we now know it, also conceptually, in the 19th century, there was also the emergence of a clearer self-understanding of what philosophy is. Philosophy is not the study, the description, explanation of a perfect phenomenon out there. It's not natural sciences. It's not mathematics either. The mathematical concepts, you know, they are different from the philosophical concepts. Okay? So it's a, it's a, philosophy is a different discipline. Okay? But the mistake that you make was, I think, was the following. You suggested the following picture. Whenever this agglomerate of philosophy of science becomes sufficiently precise, then it's not philosophy anymore. That's wrong. The point is, so philosophy helps to bring about also scientific disciplines, new ones, okay? But at the moment where this discipline manages, right, to go beyond sort of the, the universal, the one that's independent of the, of the subject and of the domain, so, for example, when psychologists managed to actually come up with laboratories, Wilhelm and Wundt, 19th century, okay? when, they, when they found a way to measure things, okay? so they could be young, whatever is sort of uh, is rational, sort of independent of the universe of discourse, that was the moment when psychology became an empirical discipline and became different from philosophy. Okay? It's not to do that once you get exact 
This is not philosophy anymore. It's once you find new methods to study a domain of discourse that goes beyond sort of the purely a priori. Okay? And uh, also when you have new concepts and new interests that are not in the sort of, of this general sort like truth, okay? but rather continuity of real functions. That's, that's the point where, where um, it becomes something else and not philosophy. But it doesn't mean it, it, it's no longer philosophy when it gets precise. That's, that's not the case. And there's one thing that I would demand, even as I said before, from the other side sort of philosophy, whatever philosophy is not doing. Ultimately, I want to have some minimal standards of rationality being satisfied. Okay? So for example, if you assert something, try the best to make it clear what, what you're saying. This is hard at the beginning. And it's be very bad, and I think you're right about it, even in philosophy, also in philosophy, maybe especially in philosophy, it would be very bad to start with the application of mathematical methods too early. Because that can have a destructive effect. You just kill the thought. You don't even know as yet what you're talking about. How on earth would you apply mathematical methods? Okay. But you should have the aim, the ambition of getting clear what you're saying. You can't, if, if, if there's a philosopher who gets satisfaction out of unclarity, then something has gone wrong. It's a bad philosopher. Okay? The other thing is, if you want to put forward a thesis, you better argue for it. Because we're at a university, it's the academic world, you don't, you, you don't just throw out theses. You give a kind of justification. It might be difficult to find out what kind of justification it is, but we want an argument. If there is a philosopher who just puts forward something, and you ask him, okay, but what good reasons can you give me for that? And they just say, reasons, I don't need any reasons. Then something has gone wrong. That's bad philosophy. Okay? So these are the minimal standards, and you know, some kind of systematicity, I, I, I demand. Give an example if you come up with a thesis. Okay? Show how it relates to previous work. You know, these are basic, very basic is it a lot of academic research. Okay? And I would claim some of them. Ultimately, if the problem gets otherwise too hard to lead to the application of mathematical methods, if you want to say more about justification, I've given you the examples. Okay? If you want to have some kind of clarity out here as a goal, then at some point mathematical methods will become important. That's my guess. Okay? But it's not that thereby truth, knowledge, justification, rational belief, being, existence, <coughs> identity, you might know, more and more about this. They all of a sudden, once you are more precise, a bit more clearer, and have a bit a better argument before, that thereby it's no longer philosophy. That would be really bad. It's still philosophy because it's in this area of rationality independently of what the world is like. Okay? But we just got a bit better in doing that. Okay? And I, I, I agree there will never be any convergence in philosophy like we have in the sciences. Okay? And the reason for me is science converges because there is a stabilizing factor out there. That's the empirical world that we are studying. That, that's the reason why there is some kind of convergence. In philosophy, we are not studying the empirical world. Okay? And we don't study the mathematical world either. But rather, we try to improve ourselves as rational beings. We try to improve human reason independently of what the world is like. Okay? And since we're not describing any reality out there, no wonder that we won't find that kind of convergence. But we can get better. And I think mathematical methods can sometimes help us to get better. Okay, so. Thank you. And so friend. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, there was a comment. Oh, I have nothing to add because everything was said. Because I would I want to mention that. Obviously, it is all relatively my, my expectation about what, what should be done, but I completely agree that if something is already so formalized that you can draw the real new, new, new results and somehow it, 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 it stops to, to belong to philosophy, usually, and historically it becomes a part of the, of the science, like physics, like, like in your example, okay, physics became physics and then all this problems which which, which uh, in ancient time philosophical are no longer philosophical but, but, but physical problems which are which are which were solved or which are, are solved at, 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 at that moment. And also the examples of Professor Polanski I think are also of this kind. Uh, that from a logical point of view the problem is solved. But it, it is there is something I, I have another example for me I have a very convincing logical argument that existence is not a predicate, okay? But I'm sure that every year there are two, two papers, philosophical papers appearing under the title Is Existence a Predicate? Okay? So logically for me it's clear, but philosophers have still some problems with it, okay? So this is, this is that, that, that it's, 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 that, that some parts simply move to 
they solve problems or they exactly formulated and exactly solve problems to other parts of our maybe artificial division into into test circuits. Okay, so so that's why my expectation that so so that's why I was a little bit skeptical about the inspiration of philosophical or or, or, or the okay applicability of this matters to philosophy. This is because yeah, of one point that matters and the example. So you, you, you said so now we have the assumptions, okay, it's not a logically valid argument, you know, Gödel's argument for the existing form thing. Yeah? Uh, and then said the other side said, well you know I never claim it's a logical validity. It's by metaphysical necessity that the premise is implied. Here's something that I didn't like and I think that, that led to a kind of misinterpretation. That shouldn't be the end of the discussion. So the next step is, okay, if this other side okay, still thinks that the premises support the conclusion, okay, but you know, not logically, but by metaphysical necessity, my next question would be, what kind of metaphysical premises do you need to add yes. right, to the set of assumptions such that then you can logically entail the conclusion? In every academic area, that should be the next question. An insane philosophy. Okay, so then the other side comes along and puts forward what is actually needed to get it done. Okay, so next step of progress, I would say, because what was tested as an assumption in the discussion so far is now explicit. And once it is explicit, you can ask, you know, is, is that really what you meant? You can start criticizing it. I mean, obviously, it's a progress. Okay, and then this is not the end of the discussion either. So it's not just about, you know, we divide things. That, that's ultimately the question is. Okay, if necessity, metaphysical necessity plays a good role here, okay, give me now a theory of metaphysical necessity. And it's not, I'm not demanding anything that's outrageous, that's what metaphysicians do these days. They give theories of metaphysical necessity, okay. The, the metaphysical necessity operator or a counterfactual operator might be a primitive theory, and then they give axioms, and they argue for it, and they play, you know. So, this is an ongoing process. It's not, it's not just basically, we have centered the logical question, that's it. And then stupid philosophers would go on and iterate the problem. So about existence, right? I, I'm, I'm sure you're right uh, that you know also some strange papers about this yes. are published. Okay, um, it might also be that in science and mathematics sometimes you know, some strange papers are published. Um, <laughs> but I, you know I'm not I'm not don't want to defend all of my colleagues not at all. Okay, but that we have improved our understanding of existence, right? I mean that should be obvious, and it doesn't have to be the end of the story either. Right? So, for example, Tim Williamson recently uh, published this book on modal logic as metaphysics. That's about high order quantification, including, of course, the high order existential quantifier. Right? And then the question is what's the interpretation? What's the logic of it? And, you know, it's full of applications to metaphysics. That's the point of it. Okay? So, you know, this is not the end of the story. This is going to be continued. Okay, thank you. Are there any more? Questions or comment on these topics? Okay. Um, well, I wanted to, to uh, have my, my tapping in mouth, but I find myself a little bit um, embarrassed because what I originally wanted to, to add, uh, actually, following um, Hans Leitgeb's uh, presentation, was largely anticipated by Professor Novelsky, um, particularly when he uh, stress the importance of distinguishing, providing the conceptual, uh, the conceptual framework from the actual results. Mathematics does many things for us. One of it is to provide a conceptual framework and indeed the associated notations more trivially. And the other is to actually provide theories. It's the theories, of course, that the mathematicians are really very interested in. Now, if you look at the conceptual the issue of conceptual framework, the interplay between mathematics and philosophy is actually extremely intimate. Um, recently, I had occasion to read a lot of 19th century works on, on logic, Boole, de Morgan, and people like that. And if you actually read Boole, I mean, not many people actually read, but if you actually read Boole and de Morgan, it's incomprehensible. These people had no idea, well, they weren't fools, but they had no idea about how to analyse even the simplest logical arguments. Sentences with two quantifiers flawed them completely. Um, because, of course, this was pre fribian they did not have the concept of a logical variable. So the concept of a logical variable, as developed by Frege, 
um, was that was of course a major conception, a major philosophical advance. Now, was this a mathematical or a philosophical uh, invention? Well, Frege was a professor of mathematics. I don't think he proved a the single theorem, um, but he was a professor of mathematics, yet his contribution was largely philosophical. Or again, um, other things that were mentioned are uh, computability. Um, right, if you look at what happened in computability theory, um, okay, so Gödel had these incompleteness theorems, and then uh, a few years later, Turing came along and said, well, actually, you just think about Turing machines and comp computability things like this. And then immediately, of course, this very hard and difficult proof using recursive functions uh, about incompleteness of arithmetic became much, much easier. And Gödel saw that instantly. I mean, he, Gödel realized instantly this was a major contribution. Was Turing doing philosophy or mathematics? Well, Turing wasn't, wouldn't really have thought of himself as a philosopher, as a mathematician, really, but he certainly wasn't a mathematician of the first rank. And I think even Turing would have agreed that we, he, he probably wasn't a first rank mathematician, but of course he made this major conceptual contribution. Or again, if you look at model theory and the development of model theory, people, people like Tarski and Schoolman, did they think of themselves as doing philosophy or, or mathematics? Very, very hard to say. It was both. It was both. It was neither. And so I think this is a very important uh, thing to, to understand that, that these these developments are really that they're both, and you you, you can't. It's senseless to separate them. Um, if you actually look at the question of theorems, so look at the other side of the coin. Um, it is very, very hard to think of an actual theorem proved in the last fifty years, certainly has any philosophical significance. And if you go back to the, the uh, examples that um, uh, Hannes mentioned, it is long list, he mentioned several things. The very good pieces of work in philosophy, let me pick just one that I know a bit about, uh, David Lewis's proof that, um, that uh, uh, natural language conditionals aren't truth functional, that they don't have natural truth values in any sense because of this, because you can't, yeah, you can't give them probabilities. Um, okay, that's a mathematical result. There is proof there. But, you know, with all due respect to David Lewis, who is a, an amazing guy um, by any measure, you know, this is a proof, half a page. I mean, it's trivial. Right? <laughs> by mathematical standards, it's trivial. And uh, I struggle to think of a mathematical, perhaps anyone can contradict me, think of a mathematical, an actual real theorem. Um, that uh, uh, from the last 50 years that has serious philosophical application. Right. And we'd love to be proved wrong. May I? Thank you. Uh, yeah, one comment uh, that I think you're right that the list, these, these are very interesting applications, but the mathematical tools are not the ones developed within the last 50 years. So, in this sense, uh, well, they are elementary. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and, and your example in the, the proof is half a page old. But why would it be otherwise, to be honest, right? No, no the question, well, no, uh, well, maybe it wouldn't. Yes. Uh, but the question was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. are there famous mathematics? No. But that doesn't undermine mathematical philosophy at all. No, yes. just in an attempt, perhaps. One is uh, what Professor Nevetsky mentioned that, well, say, multiverse programs and theory, rankings and you know, model programs, etc. But I'm not an expert, of course, and, and I couldn't mention a single theorem which is, in this sense, very important. There are many results, very technical, very abstract, and there is the whole program which is, I think, philosophically interesting, but whether it's a major philosophical breakthrough, so to say, or just a couple of very difficult and very abstract and very interesting results, that's another thing. But there's a philosophy research group in Constance, yes. Yes, yes, yes. precisely with the question that you yeah. yeah. <laughs> The philosophy of set theory group in Constance, looking yeah. precisely at the examples that you Philosophy of forcing. Yeah. And well, just an attempt uh, to, to, to mention a theorem which is, I don't know whether it's so very important, but, but I think it's somehow uh, somehow a breakthrough, namely uh, Paris, Harrington, Kirby, oh. etc. These results, because, well, you know, of course, uh, we know since Gödel that arithmetic is in incomplete, and we know since Gödel and, and Cohen that CH and many other sentences are independent, but there was no example of a natural mathematical phenomenon, so to say, which is independent. But, no, well, yeah, there would be one. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but that was in 76, so that's why I mentioned 
it is a result. I don't know whether it's really very important from the philosophical point of view, but I think that it has some importance because it's a natural sentence which is independent, not an artificial like con, piano, etc. Just an attempt. I don't know what you met you for performing, yeah, right? So good, right? Yeah. You know, it is very, very, you know, dangerous to 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 try to make strict divisions. What is what in mathematics, what is philosophy, what is in logic. I give you two examples from the seventies. Tarski's book on truth was published in a special series which probably ended with one volume, his in Polish I guess. His book, and I suspected that mathematicians didn't like to include into service uh, uh, published by the uh, Warsaw Scientific Society Mathematical Branch. So maybe they invented the special service in order to put terms. This is my, my claim. And, but, he says in introduction that the problem of truth, problem of this book, <coughs> belongs to classical problems of epistemology, not even mathematical logic. So he was conscious that he considered a philosophical problem. He said it begging. The book finishes this following way. I hope that philosophers become interested in results of this book in spite of difficult uh, terminology and formal apparatus. So, see, head of logic, one of heads of logic in the world, Warsaw, 1970, and there still worries what belongs and to which domain belongs this well, which now is considered quite clearly as a landmark of in the development of mathematical logic. Other example from the same time, Erdrand, Erdrand's fundamental book on investiga <coughs> investigation uh, 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 on the theory of demonstration, was in French, was published in the world. Erdrand never visited the wars. Why? Because in France he had no chances to publish this dissertation. Because French attitude to mathematical logic at that point Carre was complete negative. Erdrand's friend, Chevalier, asked Chepinski to help, but Chepinski agreed. And he presented this book to Warsaw Scientific Society. And another paper by Herbert, also on fundamental problem of mathematical logic, was also published in Warsaw in uh, uh, this, uh, this report of Warsaw Scientific Society. So in France, in France, at that time, mathematical logic was not a part of mathematics. Is ideological. I think that we shouldn't repeat these errors. So please, I propose. Okay, so I once again, I, I have nothing against Hegel. Yes, I wrote about continental philosophy many papers, including analysis of Hegel's criticism of syllogistic. It was very painful. <laughs> <laughs> still possible. Yeah? So, of course, some discussions are okay, but cooperate, not, 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 not deliberate. I have no problem with speaking to mathematicians. And reversely, with physicists is how much worse. Andrew Gowas, famous Polish physicist, ah, 
Nu are filozofă. Pentru dictaria a legitim de matematic, unfortunately. So, so for that, this is not a problem. There are no mathematical problems. There are mathematical tools. Yes, it's a problem, but I mean that, that there are some... And but maybe last uh, remarks, you know, there are unfair argumentations also by philosophers and also by mathematicians, polemica. For example, I remember a discussion about methods of phenomenology in Krakow. And the speaker said that we can see so-called pure greenness, pure as a quality. And I answer that I am sorry, but I also see green, dark, or, or bright, uh, with some uh, quality. So the answer was, what? Look, you are an intelligent person. Why you don't see? <laughs> 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 okay, so, but this is a philosopher. Yes, it was okay. But you read, for example, what Girard, Yves Girard, writes about Tarski. Stupid jokes. Is Tarski meta Tarski? Play language, meta language. Meta Tarski speaks to Tarski. <laughs> what is true? No, it is a kind of brain. So, so I replied that this is Girard and Meta Girard. <laughs> okay, so I think that we should avoid such arguments. Even though I sample Yes, thank you. Uh, just, just about what, in what you said about who is this triviality result. So I think I would distinguish two things. Okay? I, I think you weren't distinguishing them properly, or at least for the audience, if I look. The so one is, you're absolutely right that if you write it up, I won't steal it for the students, you know, more precisely than the news. It's one page, if you do it. but it's very elementary. It's absolutely right. So, from the mathematical point of view, you know, no one will care, of course. It's not um, in the service of proving a cool mathematical result, it's in the service of developing a philosophical theory of conditions, right? Okay. Uh, but, second thing, does that mean that the application of the mathematical, mathematical method didn't pay off in that case? It sounded a bit as if you thought they were related, but that's not, that's not right. No, no. Let me finish. Let me finish. So, that's not right. So, here's a little, I'll use a similar dialectic strategy like you. Right? Okay. Anyone who thought, I, I, I would have seen it in the, you know, the second as a problem about that thesis that the probability of condition law is a condition of probability, they, they would have to agree to the following. So, Robert Stallman <laughs> is a super intelligent person and philosopher. Okay? He didn't see it. So if anyone tells me, okay, they saw this kind of statement and they thought about it a little bit without the implication of dynamic methods, and they immediately see the problem, okay? They must be cleverer than, than um, Robert Stallmaker. And let me assure you, Robert Stallmaker is clever. They, he didn't see it. And Dorothy Etching, okay, who's also very clever. She has, for a good reason, coined the term bombshell for the result, the triviality theorem. So no, you wouldn't see it, okay? And working it out with, with probability theory, exploiting it in that way, you know, shows that, it's, uh, uh, that progress has been made, okay? How you react to the result, what you give up, what you do, you know, there's a long literature that, that came out of it, okay? But it's clear the application of probabilistic methods paid off here. And one final remark on that, it goes back to the work by Ernest Adams, right, as you know, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, okay? So there's this beautiful book on the logic of conditionals by Ernest Adams, okay? The basic idea is, let's presuppose the ultimate subjective probability theory, and let's measure the degree of acceptability of a conditional as a conditional probability, which is a very natural thought, okay? And then, what he does, is that's not the end, right? What he shows is, he, he, he determines a sound and complete system of logic for conditions from that idea. It's a probabilistic semantic, it's not a truth conditional one. It's not logical validity for argument does not mean <coughs> truth preservation or models. It means something like preservation of high enough probability. And this is made precise. It could only be made precise through probabilistic means. And the completeness proof for that you need probability theory. And you know it's not obvious at all. Okay? This is clear progress on 
in philosophy of language, in the philosophy of conditionals. Yeah. And if you open up these days uh, uh, Bennett's book on conditionals, which is something like a standard textbook in the philosophy of language, the author, Bennett, Jonathan Bennett, he's a standard you know, philosopher of metaphysics, philosophy of language. He's not into formal methods at all in principle. Okay? But what he has is two chapters on Adams' theory and the impossibility result. And he worked really hard to understand everything, to reconstruct the proofs because, why did he do that? Because he thought it really pays off philosophically. Half of the book is about sort of roughly the probabilistic account of a particular condition. Okay? And this is really important for him. Okay? So this has arrived at sort of the standard philosophy of language literature. And the application of probabilistic methods could not be rejected. You could just say, let's go back where we didn't use it. But then you would have lost lots of insights that you can only gain from the probabilistic method. So that's why I think it's a good example. Even though for a pure mathematician, you know, they would take would take them five minutes to look at the proof and they would see. It. Um, but by the way, if you look at Cantor's proof of the uncountability of the reals, not that Lewis's result is of the same point, not at all, but it's also quite very elementary, right? You write it up, it's a couple of lines, right? But I mean within math it was huge progress. We don't doubt that as a proof. That's true, yeah. So far. Um, uh, if I come back, I feel um, as, as uh, uh, Professor Wilinski and Dwight get, um, I take it, uh, confirmed my remarks. Um, on the one hand, the distinct, when it comes to the um, conceptual contribution um, made by mathematics and philosophy, one, it, it, the distinctions between mathem mathematics and philosophy become somewhat artificial. Um, and uh, on the other hand, if you look at many of these fine results in philosophy, and there's no doubt about it, but the, the, the analysis of the semantics of uh, natural language conditions is, is great work. Uh, it's great work by the standards in any discipline. Um, the, uh, the contribution is, I think, essentially one of a conceptual framework, provided on the one hand a conceptual framework, and uh, on the other hand, at that, with that conceptual framework, and of course philosophical analysis and, and a little bit of calculation, it is a little bit of calculation, we, we, we come to a new understanding. And now, now we see things completely differently. We, we, just, we just view conditionals in a completely different way. What was confusing before is that very clear. Just as sentences with uh, two quantity, with sentences with two uh, determiners are now very simple for us to analyse after the invention of the logical variable. It's just a so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't really see uh, both of your points, both of your, uh, uh, your points as, as being uh, actually antithetical to what I said. So. No, but you would agree that it's part mathematics is part of these frameworks, and then you better with know. That's exactly I part think, of. I think I'm yeah. professing the first case yeah. part the, 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 the contemporary. Exactly. Yes, yeah, totally. And I mean, that's basically what Karna always suggested, right? So the main contribution that that he thought in philosophy should make is develop new conceptual frameworks, right? And through, if you look at this philosophy, throughout the outboard of logical systems of language, <laughs> uh, meaning and necessity in logical foundations of probability, it's always the creation of our sort of new frameworks, but logic and mathematics play a role in setting them up, okay? Also improving the first results there, okay? And then when, when the question arises, you know, can we derive something really complicated there? You could just go to a mathematics department and ask them, you know, then becomes a purely mathematical question. But ultimately, you know, it's philosophical frameworks that we're developing here. I mean, it's not that a mathematician is interested in the semantics of conditional, right? That's a philosophical question. And it has always been like that. Yes, other questions or comments? Well, of course, I come back to the skeptics. <laughs> Of course, when you look at the list of that Professor Leipzig gave, uh, it's, which is impressive, probably you can have many more slides with showing yeah. application of mathematics. So, these are evidently, these are successes and proofs that mathematics works in some ways. But still, for a person like me, I'm a philosophical amateur. Okay? But still, I have somewhat a question. What are the problems or aspects of problems, of philosophical problems, that mathematics is rather useless? For me, it's somehow important, this kind of question. And just another remark. Well, you, if I understood well, you say that uh, philosophy can uh, consider problems that are 
that do not concern the world somehow. Uh, that, uh, well, I would not agree with that because even if we deal with purely abstract concepts, it's still the world because it's us. <laughs> because it's us that. But that's not what I meant. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, so we are not. I would, I would just this. You know, other philosophers might disagree, but from my point of view, you know, um, philosophers are not in the business of describing, explaining, and predicting phenomena mm -hmm. out there. Sure. This, okay. and, and, and this is also not unheard of. I would guess mainstream would agree with me, okay? but not everyone would. But that's what I meant. Okay. Okay. So, you, let's just look at an example. Right? I gave this little example of justifying why, you, if you're perfectly rational, you ought to distribute your degrees of belief according to a probability measure. Okay. So, then there are arguments. Right? Now, what these arguments do is basically they show that very roughly in every possible world in which you wouldn't do that. There is a problem. Okay? You're practically irrational. You lose bets. Okay? And it's not that you lose the bet just in the, as in the actual world. Okay? You lose it whatever the world is like. You quantify all possible worlds in the world. Okay? Or take the logic, right? So logical truth preservation means truth preservation in every model, very roughly in every possible world. Right? That's, that's what the philosophers are interested in. Amongst these possible worlds, there's the actual world. So that means logic has an application, of course, you know, in the actual world. And logic and uh, probability theory, subjective probability theory, has, has an application in, in the actual world and so on. But once you, you notice that you're dealing with a subject area that restricts the set of all possible worlds to just this fragment thereof, okay, then already you have made a step away from philosophy. And of course, the physicist is not interested in every sort of you know, logically, I would say, maybe metaphysically possible world, but you know, in, in you know, a restricted class of worlds, okay? ultimately, I hope in the actual world. Okay? And once they have found a method, namely the empirical method, experiments, control experiments, right, replicability and so on, to, to get access to it, right, then it ceases to be philosophy, it becomes physics. Okay? That, so that, that's what happens. With computer science, uh, um, it, computer science is also a different area from philosophy. Right? I mean, it should be clear. I, by the way, uh, I guess most applications, I, mean, I think you agree that there's still, it's still important to apply mathematical methods in computer science. Of course. Of course, right? And it's, it's these are the restrictions that you've given, right? Yeah. But it's still the case, right? Of course. And usually, I would claim the applications of the mathematical methods applied are relatively simple ones. <laughs> but look, machine learning. No. The, I mean, the mathematical content no, no. Is, is not well, that. Right. In the analysis, uh, I don't agree. Really. In the analysis of our business, you can get No, no, no. I didn't, no, no. I, that, no. Yes, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I just say, if, but what the engineer, not this unfair, is it? I mean, what the engineer, that was important. What the engineer these days are applying, you know, when, they, uh, when they run a machine learning algorithm, from the mathematical point of view, is not that hard. Would you agree? Um, that there are clearly some applications in math of mathematics in computer science which are easy. But yes, I, 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 see, most of them I, are. I, I believe them. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Most That's what I'm saying. But most, I, I see in mathematics, in computer science, applications in mathematics are much more sophisticated and much more integral to the development of the subject than, than I know in philosophy. Yes, give us 50 years. Uh, yeah, uh, right. sure, sure. I mean, but I agree. But my point was just, you know, if you thought that mathematics only pays off in computer science where it becomes fancy mathematics, that would be completely wrong. No, but just that it sometimes does. Yeah. When it's fancy mathematics. And I don't quite see that in philosophy. Uh, that's a different matter. You, you, you're okay. it's early stages to some extent. Okay. With the deep learning, of course, it's uh, quite easy to understand um, how it works, but we don't know what it does. That's <laughs> it. Very good, but it's not a mathematical question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You might use mathematical methods to address that question, but it's not yeah. a mathematical question. Okay, we are slowly approaching towards the end. I propose that every participant, perhaps starting this time from the north, that means from, from Professor Bush, would uh, give a brief summary, but giving a summary would mean repeating the discussion. So let's focus on the last question. What awaits mathematical philosophy? Ha! <laughs> Just make a prediction. Uh, 
I, I want to be optimistic, okay? After, after everything I heard here during the discussion, uh, especially that there are really some, that my, my expectations about applying uh, mathematical methods and philosophy are really fruitful, uh, then I think that this kind of application of, of connection between philosophy and mathematics, which I had always in mind, so you really solve the problem, the philosophical problems using mathematical methods, not just speculate about, uh, not just formalize uh, um, uh, the, the some philosophical uh, concepts, or not just uh, uh, deliberating about the philosophical implication of some uh, mathematical uh, results. Uh, then, then I'm optimistic. Okay. So, one zero for yes. optimism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, I would like to uh, somehow stress that uh, I really <coughs> appreciate precision of uh, acts of speech, of expressing ideas in philosophy, and I am all for it. Okay. But then. What awaits mathematical philosophy? Well, as far as applying uh, mathematical methods to phil in philosophical discourse, I am sure, as it has already been <coughs> in the past, that this will continue. And I think it's very good, because mathematics is uh, a very precise language <coughs> and method of doing the research. <coughs> On the other hand, like Professor Kush said, that you would await solving a problem, solving problems in philosophy. My feeling is that, the, uh, that philosophy, that the real problems in philosophy remain unsolved. And this is somehow, the, when you look from the past, the, the basic problems are like they, they remain unsolved, and this is not accident, because they touch on the very fundamental issues, very fundamental issues of, about the reality, about our existence. And, they, and when time changes, the, our answers will change, they will be various outlooks, and this is the strength of philosophy, the strength of philosophy. So I believe that uh, this precision provided by mathematical methods may clarify the possible answers, but not necessarily, I would not expect solutions to the great problems of philosophy. Okay, thank you very much. So there is some reservation, I don't know how to tell you about Two zero four. Two zero four. Two zero four. Two zero four. Two the clarity of philosophy consists not in solving the problems, I agree, but every time, every epoch, must invent a language to present all philosophical problems. <coughs> Sometimes these problems are more specific, and I think that you can observe in history. So for me, mathematical or formal philosophy is simply a new language, uh, which, successful or not, uh, expresses old problems. But the question is the same. They are unsolved by these methods, but clarifying, clarifying, clearer, Mm, in another way than before. One example. It is stupid to uh, discuss determinist, indeterminist controversy in Aristotelian terms, or even uh, you know, using only classical mechanics. But we must simply use modern physics, quantum mechanics, and so on. But it is still unsolved because, you know, in, in Heisenberg principles, 
what the, the term determines or who determines doesn't do anymore, that all this not in premises cannot be in conclusion and, uh, unless we define. Well, for example, uh, Heisenberg himself defined uh, indeterminist in a way that, that, that it is not what, something opposite to classical mechanics. He derived the conclusion that quantum mechanics is indeterministic. But if you change the definition yes, and say that well, stochastic determinism is quite legitimate. So, but issue returns. And my experience is I can read, for example, Aristotle, Plato, but it is not this language which I prefer. It's even 19th century, if you say about the bull, it is not acceptable. Contemporary point of view, but if you try to understand his situation, historical situation, it was a new theory, very important. So, this is my philosophical point. It is a language, some results, of course, which we use. I think that only a very small amount of sciences and mathematics can be used in philosophy successfully. And it is okay because it will be a very bad situation if every site or almost every scientific design could be translated into philosophy. And so I am very happy that a few ideas can be used at least by of course, if people invent quantum psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Professor Levatsky that so the, the deep philosophical questions they don't remain with us. Um, um, but I think we get more and more rational in asking them and in determining the possible answers to them, and occasionally we can rule out some of these answers as no longer being live, as it were. Okay. Um, but they will, they will not go, but we get better in doing what I've just described. Um, and part of this getting better is, I think, improving the methodology of how to approach them. Right? Very often progress in all areas in the academic world, progress is made by improving the methodology, improving the methods. And I think uh, getting better as a philosopher also involves in improving our methods and um, using mathematical methods where 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 fruitful. That's not everywhere, but where fruitful um, is is one of these uh, improvements. So um, that's I, what I would expect to happen also uh, in the future. Mathematical philosophy will not conquer all of philosophy, but I don't know any single mathematical philosopher who ever claimed otherwise. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not an army of mathematical philosophers trying to conquer the world with guns in their hand, like that. Okay? But you know, we just want to be better philosophers. And occasionally, that uh, involves and might even require the application of mathematical methods. Right? Um, shouldn't be, shouldn't be a big issue. And what I find exciting is that many, many young philosophers uh, these days uh, discover um, mathematical methods in. How to use mathematical methods in their philosophical work. Okay. And by the way, if I may say that, um, since there's a, I think just one female philosopher in the room, um, more and more um, female philosophers discover mathematical philosophy. Okay. Though we have a summer school which is in mathematical philosophy just for female philosophers, it's been run now for the last couple of years. It's hugely successful, meaning it attracts lots of young. Uh, philosophers, and many of them, they do their PhD, and many have already found tenure positions and, and so on. So, you know, that, that, that I think is very exciting about it. Many young philosophers discover the applicability of formal methods in philosophy. And it becomes sort of a walk, not just a walk, but it becomes sort of the, the usual thing to use there. Not for every, each and every purpose, but, you know, 
It's not, it's not, in the meantime, it's, no, it's not particularly sensational anymore. Right? And that's good, I think. I think that's good. Just like the final, the final <laughs> anecdote about the rationality. <laughs> so two friends, the mathematician and the poet, hunted, and they shot several birds. But my dear, you are a mathematician, please count. For, for you, it's easier. Diane. Uh, Ten. 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 One second. Nine. Ten. How do you count? Zero, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was a very, very of the He's attributed to what's what she means. Correct. That was a very stimulating discussion. Let us thank our...